Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having us. Um, it's great to be back in Kokstad, uh, depending upon whether you've navigated the potholes or the school children to get here. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Brett for the opportunity for us to be here. Um, what we want to do today is, is introduce something which we think is important to everybody, primary care practitioners in particular, because you're going to be very much involved in driving this kind of program um, to screen patients for lung cancer. Uh, as we know, lung cancer is uh, the biggest cause of cancer mortality in, in males, um, and it's an increasing problem in females. We only get the disease very late, um, and the only way that we can lower the mortality is by screening for lung cancer. So I'd like to kick off this evening by asking Dr. Jerome Pillay to talk about the surgeon's role, and we will also have uh, Dr. Pelham Pick talking about the oncologist's role, and Phil Hartwig uh, will talk to us about the radiological side, which is very, very important. And thank you very much. It's over to you, Jerome. Thanks so much, guys. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here, and I look forward to to building a collaboration where we share a lot of value and have lots of patients and build something amazing. So lung cancer screening, the surgeon's role. So this is, oh, sorry. That's JJ and J, our obligatory marketing. You know, you just gotta put that in there. It's not that clear. But I just want to start off with a scenario. So my father, this is a true story. <laughs> it's not a, not a story. So my father-in-law is a general practitioner in the Eastern Cape. He's also a sheep farm. Um, and, you know, I'm preparing for this. I actually called him and said, listen, uh, we actually spoke a while back and said, listen, you know, what are the challenges that we face in setting these kind of things up? Because sometimes we come from this point of reference and we don't have some real on the ground understanding of what are the challenges. And these are the things we've got to solve today. It's not just about, oh, this is what the surgeon does, this is what the oncologist does, this is what the radiologist, now send us your patients. You know, so, you know it's really not that. And, and the one thing that he said was communication. Uh, I think his biggest thing is his patients go to the specialists. He doesn't know what happened. They come back, he has to deal with the chronic post thoracotomy pain syndrome, the minor wound breakdown, the guy's short of breath, he doesn't know whether it's normal or not normal, tries to find out, nobody, nobody knows. I think you guys all have those kind of patients, you know. I think it's something uh, which is a big shortcoming on our side. Uh, and I think that's a large part of JJ and J's to try and fix that with systems. You know, to try and create a data flow where we all in control of it as a team and being able to say, listen, this is our patient. At the end of the day, uh, I mean, my father-in-law told me he treats patients, families for 30 years. You know, he knows stuff about this oak like what drugs he did as a teenager, now he's got lung cancer. <laughs> like maybe we should have a conversation, you know? Um, and, and you know, that's the thing, we gotta, we gotta actually increase the scope of our conversation. So the scenario is a patient in the, in the, in the Eastern Cape, high risk patient, has got now you know, reason to say, listen, let's screen this guy, and then something, you, you pick up something, right? What do we do with this guy? How do we sort him out? And how do we make it actually sustainable and, and actually a good thing for the patient, not a good thing for the receiving hospital, you, if you get what I'm saying. So, right, so why should we care? So lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death amongst both men and women. And it's almost 25% of cancer deaths, right? It's a scary statistic, you know. And if you combine colon, breast, and prostate, 
combine all of them, it doesn't get close to lung cancer. But we have like international days with ribbons and, you know, nude marathons and and the, the, the whole lot of it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the prostate, the prostate, anyway, we are talking. <laughs> Um, but you see, long, it, it's, it's kind of just not being up front and center, and largely because we pick these guys up so late, it's almost, you know, there's not much we can do for them. Now, in a sort of environment like this, it's the upper middle income environment, people who have a um, middle class has a medical aid, there's lifestyle disease, and if you look at the leading causes of death in the world, ischemic heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and then trachea, bronchus, and lung cancers. So this is a serious, serious thing, and if you look at the world stats in this region, you guys are seeing it. There's no doubt of it. There are a hell of a lot of patients who have silent tumors. And now as, as a team, we, we got to say, you know what, let's stop frustrating ourselves every time we get somebody who's in stage four and we're palliating them and trying to talk to the family and say, listen, you know, it's end of days. Because we do that far, far, far too often. In fact, I think for every one curative lung cancer resection we do, James, I don't know, probably 10 or more palliative end stage, you know, it's, 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 it's a huge imbalance. So, so just quickly to recap, it's the second most frequent cause of cancer, leading cause of cancer death worldwide. We spoke about the ribbons and that. And the increasing cancer rates, 20, 30 lung cancer rates, this is now the extrapolation, it's going to get go up between 45 and 190 percent. That's a hell of a lot of patients. Now we've got to get these guys early and we've got to get them sorted out. Now only 16 percent are actually diagnosed at an early stage and to 70 percent. So seven out of ten actually come at an incurable palliative thing and we just biopsy stuff sent to the oncologist if they're lucky, you know, there's fancy immunotherapy, and if they're not lucky, they're not lucky, you know. It's, uh, so, the National Lung Screening Trial is the largest randomized controlled trial, and it shows there's a 20% fewer deaths from lung cancer with low-dose CT. All right, so now this is like strong evidence that's come up quite recently. The Nelson trial showed a marked decrease, 24% fewer lung cancer deaths with screening in men especially. This is where we are. I mean, this is our country's population density. It's not the lung cancer. I saw a few faces go <laughs> It's just our population. So, so, you know, we've got density in Kauteng, Western Cape, and then this is actually mega, mega, mega huge part of our country. And we don't have any actual organized sort of thing. And, and you know, this is, this is the message that we want to want to get across is let's sort out this. Let's have a system that actually works. So what do we need, all right? You need primary care physicians who actually own the patient. You know, all of us come in and we do our bit, but the primary care physician owns the patient. And, and that means the information, the data, the flow, the communication, all of that has to be proper. You know, otherwise we're gonna do these patients a disservice and we're just doing it to get our stats up. And I don't think that's the, that's the aim or the goal or anything like that. Right? Whole bunch of specialists. You're gonna hear from some of the guys today, but um, you can see a proper multidisciplinary team takes a lot of stuff, right? And a lot of people and working together. So just to quickly go on to the, on the role of surgery, you know, 
So as, as a surgeon, when it comes to this, we, we play a part in the pre-operative, operative and post-operative phase and, and drive the diagnostic, some therapeutic palliative and some combined procedures. Now, you guys all know this. I don't need to tell you. And some combined procedures, for example, draining a, a pleural effusion is diagnostic, therapeutic, and possibly palliative, you know. But um, the aim of the screening is to pick the patients up early, go the diagnostic road, aim for all naught resections if possible, and provide a curative uh, service with proper follow-up. And in order to do that, radiology, Oncology is absolutely important. Now, here's my father-in-law. Has his mate who's been a smoker and he works in a mine, etc., etc., and he's got a family history. He does a scan, and this is what they find. Now, what do we do with this? You know, what? Who do we phone? What do we call? If you look at the Fleischner guidelines. Things for solitary pulmonary nodules. You know, do we follow it up at this level or do we escalate it? You know, it's 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 not very clear. And and the idea is to actually create a system where you say, listen, this guy's high risk. I see this. He needs to go into a decision-making system that's bigger than one person. It's actually a team that says, we're going to handle this patient from now on. And so surgical decisions, when it comes to surgical things that we can do, it's a very small piece of the pizza, you know, but it's an important piece and we've got to get all the pieces to actually have a good pizza, you know. Uh, and our piece is, you know, we, we with a radiologist can do radi radiologically guided tissue sampling and then go from minimally invasive things Bronchoscopy, mediastinoscopy, and then segmentectomy. Your segmentectomy is an evidence more and more in younger patients with low risk factors that possibly the future of segmentectomy is is, is going to you know change. It's a it, lung cancer is an evolving landscape, and with the advent of newer surgeries, video assisted surgery, and in the future definitely robotic surgery. You know, we got to stay at the forefront of those things, but the lung, lung cancer is actually, the, the surgical treatment of lung cancer is actually going to change, you know. We, we can't treat all those people in that band of population that I showed you the way we did in 10 years ago, or 10 years from now, how we did it today. So, lobectomy is still the gold standard. Uh, pneumonectomy is in block resections, especially T3N naught tumors or chest wall involvement. It can become quite complex. They need multidisciplinary, you need the plastic surgeon, and that. But these patients are here. I, I'm pretty convinced. Statistically, these patients are here. Um, then you get to the more palliative things, which is things like pleurodesis and permanent drains like a pleurex. But, you know, if I put in a plurex drain and the patient comes back here and nobody's told the primary care physician what this is, and here Oak walks into your rooms with a piece of tube sticking out of his chest, you know, and some something that looks like a urine bag, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be. So we actually need to have a system where information is spread, not just patient to patient, but on an educational platform, and we actually quite chuffed to have Renee, who's driving our education program. And, uh, you know, we're focusing on a lot of things, you know, systematically. And at some point, drains and drain management is going to be made into professional videos, resources, things we can all, you know, standardize and look at. And hopefully, all of us will be on the same platform to look at those kind of things. So education and ongoing education, you know, it mustn't be a flash in the pan that we come here, we say hi, we go off and expect you folks to, you know, and like we gotta we gotta put wood in the fire as well from our side. That surgical decision, so what it looks like. When a, when a patient gets referred, goes through radiology, and then 
But this is just for example. Now, there's lots of categories like this. I'm not going to bore you with what do you do with the N2 disease? What do you do with the T1? What do they... This is just an example. This is a stage one cancer. You've got to start off with a multidisciplinary discussion. And then you have to look, what are the options? Lobectomy, segmentectomy, what is the evidence? You know, are we going to, is it the ground glass opacity? What's the size? Are we going to assess the lymph nodes? Are we going to do a complete lymph node dissection? And how are we going to approach it? Is it going to be open? What's the safest? What's the best long-term outcome? And this is stuff, you know, it's like playing soccer. If, if you have one oak on the field who's part of the team, but he doesn't know where the ball is, he's just going to be running around aimlessly, and he's going to become a liability. And often, you know, we work as in silos. And, and we, I mean, I'm guilty. You do something, and then you just forget to send the letter, forget to tell anyone. And then the rest of the team doesn't know what you did. And, and that. So that's the idea. That's what we're going to change. And this is the sort of thinking for surgical approach. You know, it's logical, it's evidence-based, and then needs to be followed up. And I think oncology guys drive that a lot. You know, these guys need to be followed, they need to be screened, but it needs to be communicated. Uh, I work closely with Dr. Rob Wilson from, from Hopeland, and he's fantastic. Like, I don't know where he gets the time to write these letters, <laughs> but he writes proper letters. And I think we actually should make the time to, 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 to write those letters. But surgery doesn't start with a cut. Surgery actually starts here. And this is about ERAS. You see, as a primary physician, as part of the team, we've got to have the insight into, you know, what is the road ahead for this patient? How do we optimize preoperatively, intraoperatively? You know, you, you look at, <clears throat> is it resectable? Yes. But is the patient operable? from a physiological point of view, how can we optimize? How can we sort all of that stuff? Because often we may say, listen, the oaks need to be optimized. So your multidisciplinary team here might need to get the ERAS protocol that we're rolling out, I think in April, um, and say, listen, this patient, fantastic, we're gonna do his surgery, but we need to optimize this, this, and this, it's gonna take a couple of weeks. Send him back home. And then that we do that here. You know, we get that re optimization done and then take it back for the intraoperative and the postoperative things. And things like nutrition, things like patient education, information, making sure the family is involved. You know, this whole thing of saying, hi, Mr. X, I'm going to cut your tumor out tomorrow. Bye. Yeah, that doesn't work. Patients don't do well. And if you involve patients' family, you know, at the end of the day, we all want one thing. We want quality of life. And quality of life includes that patient's family. It includes their relationship with their family. It includes those kind of things. So education and information, absolutely important. Right? It's a multidisciplinary team. So from the first decision, the whole team has to be aware of this patient and where they are in this pros of workflow. And it's got to be protocol driven. You know, some doctors are too big for protocols and we shouldn't be those because it's evidence-based, based on millions and millions of people and comes out of hectic research. And we should be able to say, how do we streamline our things with protocols? Because it makes us all talk the same language. You know, and there is room for us to adjust and change things. But I think if we have a ERAS protocol driven approach in a proper structured setup, we we bound to succeed with this. So what are the frustrations of a fragmented system? I think no continuity of care. We can all identify with that often need no detailed feedback to the primary general practitioner. The follow-ups are fragmented, because what happens is the surgeon does his follow-up, oncologist does his follow-up, 
physician does his follow up because Oak also got high blood pressure and he's got something else and he doesn't know that this Oak had cancer because nobody told him. And, you know, and the, the orthopedic surgeon fixed his femur and took him to theater without knowing he's got paraneoplastic low sodium. That's, that's reality, you know. So follow-ups, but most importantly, the data is lost. And we can't measure success. So how are we going to know if what we're doing is actually working if we don't measure it? And I think a large part of what we're doing is to have a central database to say all these patients go in there and they get sorted out from there. And we all have access. So the solution is to have structure, access to data. We gotta have the patient and the healthcare team and funder buy-in and collaboration. And I'm quite pleased to, to say that I think Discovery is now approved screening, low-dose screening to be paid. And I think the other medical aids will follow suit pretty soon, but it opens a huge, it's a big, big step for lung cancer screening. All right. And so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There is a core template. The Global Lung Cancer Coalition makes this freely available. There's already established systems. It's a plug and play system. And we just got to combine with local and international collaborations, affiliation. There is huge support for lung cancer globally. And we just need to decide, let's actually get on the bus, you know, and do this. So with that said, well, this is just an example of workflow. It doesn't have to be our workflow. But for example, a clinician here places an order for a uh, low-dose low CT, it then goes to a nurse navigator, so that's one person you call and says, listen, I'm scanning this guy. That nurse navigator now takes over this patient, contacts the patient, make sure that it's appropriate, then the patient gets scanned, radiology goes through the scan and they report, they enter the info into the database, and centrally the nurse navigator has alerted of this data and then manages the patient from there and moves and informs. Now this is just an example of a single workflow. Uh, and we can make our own one work, however you guys, and I think that's a discussion that we want to have. So how do we make advanced cardiothoracic care available to the Cockstart region? And what we came up with is a single number. So in the next week or two, what we're going to share is a single number where you don't have to find out who's on call. You know, you don't have to phone and say, oh, is, is Dr. Fulton on holiday or, you know, that kind of stuff. You still phone your, you know, the people, but there'll be a number where you phone for anything advanced cardiothoracic for advice. Uh, and of course, lung cancer and thoracic surgery is a big part of it, but also advanced intensive care support. You know, in your hospital, you put somebody on a ventilator and things are going south. Uh, you know, we we driving a fantastic ECMO program, an in-state heart failure option. This is just a few examples of, of what can be done. But this, this idea of having a central number that actually works, I think it's a fantastic sort of tool that we can say, listen, I know my patient's gonna be taken care of. Because what you wanna do is you wanna share value, you gotta have te teamwork, you gotta have feedback, feedback and continuity in this. So with that, this is the JJ and J team, good bunch of people. We call each other family, because you don't have to be blood related to be family. And that's us in a nutshell. And I'd like to say that this should just be the start of the conversation. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have any questions about what was discussed now? Obviously, we're just starting the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> So you don't have to shout about now. Does anyone have any comments? Um, is there 
are you looking at, I know Ned here, for example, has the electronic medical regulars coming out here on the sweeping out across the, the, the system. Are you looking at perhaps using that as a method of keeping more equitable with us, we, at least we can, mm -hmm. keeping the community of care and not having someone drop off the side of the road? Um, yeah. Are you looking into it? Yeah, so I think the systems that we use are well already, well, we're planning on properly using, include plug-in systems. So the data can be plugged into any sort of hospital management system. Um, uh, Medi clinics developing their own and the data needs to be able to uh, speak to that. But it also, because of the nature of IT and artificial intelligence, it's designed to be able to speak to any hospital management system. So provided the permissions are there, the patient can then be seen on, on, on practically any any uh, system. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that phone number that you have, is it a 24-hour phone number, or is it only like the five? Yeah, yeah, because it's it's also for emergency ECMO care and that it will be answered. So not this, the same person might not have the phone all the time, but it will be answered. Uh, and, 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 and often, in, like in an emergency setting, it's not to always send your patient. You know, if you have somebody crashing and you just want somebody to say, just listen to me, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's a fantastic sort of thing that, that, that we can build, you know, and hopefully it grows. You had a question? Right. Right. Now, the 25% where breast cancer, I mean, lung, sorry, <laughs> where lung cancer is, um, is, it a, is it where it's a primary or is it just when they eventually end up having lung cancer? No, no, so this is primary lung cancer, yeah. Metastatic disease um, is also a huge problem and often we have to palliate that and look at other things like metastatectomies, etc. if we're looking at curative intent, etc. But but this this is just purely about primary primary. primary. So, so the question, no, no. Is there such a increasing lung cancer when there's a focus on people's smoking? Is it Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. And maybe James can can give us give us insight. But I think smoking is still a large driver. And also because the risk doesn't stop, you know, when you smoke. And with pollution and also exposure to toxic chemicals and, and uh, you know, this, this asbestos and all this like stuff that we expose to radon gas, for example, you know, we don't know everything. And, and I've got a bugbear about food. Uh, just out of interest sake, you go read the FDA. You know processed meat that you buy, like salami, is listed by the FDA as a carcinogen. It's listed. It's there. It's on their website. But we all just chart. So, <laughs> so but I mean, it's, it's a good question. I mean, it's a, it's a multivectorial thing. I think genetics, environmental, so, environmental and social, social sort of circumstances all feed into it at different sort of levels. I think also as we expect that populations across the world of an age, especially in the first world, we are going to see an increase in almost every single cancer as small populations age. So I think just the risk. One's definitely, definitely one of them will. Yeah. Simply put, if you live long enough, you're going to die of one of two things, cancer or cardiovascular disease. Um, or maybe a jealous spot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but thanks very much, guys. Thank thanks, Gerard. Um, I'd like to introduce Pelham Peak. He's the oncologist from Hopelands Cancer Center. He's going to give us his uh, perspective on, from the oncologist's point of view on lung cancer screening. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys, and thanks for the organizers. I think this is a great initiative. And thanks to JJ and Jay. My interaction with them has been really positive, and as well as with the Kaufman radiologists. I think we've got a good team in Maritzburg and in Hilton and going down into Hillcrest and Durban. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. 
preparing the talk, I uh, you know wasn't sure what to say because our role is obviously once the cancer has been diagnosed. And um, what what I the take home message from this evening from my side would be that there has been a change and a progression in what the oncologist can do. And unfortunately, there is a quite a bad stigma about chemotherapy and radiotherapy these days. And um, almost every single patient I see asks me, "Why can't I just use cannabis?" You know, and uh, so, so. Um, <laughs> so I'm quickly just going to go through some stats. This is from um, our National Cancer Registry from 2019. You can see that only roughly 2,600 cases was histologically confirmed. Now we know it must be a lot more than that. Um, so about 1,000 in females and 1,600 in males. And uh, we, we've all seen the patient that's been repeatedly treated for TB or whatever, and then eventually gets diagnosed with a lung cancer, but then he's you know performance status four and not even fit enough to have a biopsy. So we know the numbers must be higher than this. Oh goodness. Okay, so small cell and non-small cell lung carcinoma are the two big categories in lung cancer. And we'll be talking about non-small cell cancer. Small cell lung cancer is a completely different disease and managed completely differently. So again, um, squamous and adenocarcinomas are the ones we see most common. And we've made massive grounds in treatment of adenocarcinomas with the advent of immunotherapy and targeted therapies that are much better tolerated than they were in the past. So platinum chemotherapies has been around for a long time and um, they remain to this day the standard of care for the correct patient. But unfortunately, they also come with a lot of toxicity, the nausea being terrible, um, kidney or, or renal, renal impairment, um, bone marrow suppression. So the platinum drug in itself has been responsible for a lot of the uh, um, stigma around chemotherapy. But it's got an interesting history. So Dr. Rosenberg in 1960s, uh, did some experiments. Now he was a chemist, but also had a PhD in physics. So for some reason they were doing experiments on, on gram negative bacteria and ran electrical currents across these dishes to see what would happen if they exposed these bacteria to electrical current. And they used uh, uh, platinum electrodes because they thought those would have the least impact on the organisms. And then ironically, they started boiling off these uh, platinum compounds and the bacteria started dying from the platinum and not from the electrical current. So it was by pure chance that one of the most common chemotherapy drugs was, was uh, found. So this was uh, published in Nature in 1968. Um, and from there, clinical trials started and the way the platinum killed the organisms was by forming cross bands between the DNA helixes. So as you go through cell division, the helix unwinds and the platinum forms cross bridges and then the cell cannot divide, it goes through apoptosis. And again, by pure chance, which I think is, is quite nice. Um, so, so it was eventually FDA approved in 1978 and the combination of cisplatin and navelbean became the gold standard in 1990 and remains the gold standard for or some sort of chemo or, or plat platin doublet remains the standard for the correct patient. So not, not much changed in about 20 or 25 years. Um, it was only until early 2000 that these newer drugs were developed. So bevacizumab or Avastin was punted as one of the big game changers um, it's a monoclonal antibody, and the name can be confusing. Although it's an antibody, it's not immunotherapy. It's an antibody against the vascular endothelial growth factor, and it neut neutralizes or uh, uh, prevents the binding to the endothelial receptors, inhibiting angiogenesis. So there is uh, the, the pathway, and um, there's uh, sorry, that's not very clear. 
but an artist's impression of how the Avastin binds to the vascular endothelial growth factor and inhibits angiogenesis. And they started using this or doing clinical trials in almost all cancers, and we thought that it was going to be a game changer. I was only in medical school then, so I didn't know about all these uh, things, but my colleagues that have been around longer than I have say that they thought that this was going to change the field of oncology. And it had an impact, but not as big as we expected. Um, it does have some serious side effects, hemoptysis in lung cancer being one of them. And in that uh, very first phase two trial, there were four fatalities, which is quite a high percentage if you look at the total number of patients of 67. And hemoptysis is not a pleasant way to die for anyone involved. So it lost a little bit of momentum. And then a few years later, tyrosine kinase inhibitors were developed, the so-called TKIs, and they are extremely nice and oral therapies with very low side effects. And that is what inspired this lecture to, to be able to show you guys that there are other options now to tell your patients that it's worthwhile to drive through to Hilton or Durban or wherever, because these things work and they are well tolerated. So gefitinib was one of the first ones um, and it's a small molecule, so it acts on the intracellular level. So here's the pathway, so that's your cell membrane, um, that's the epidermal growth factor receptor. And now we've got first, second, and even third generation TKIs for the EGFR receptor. And they all inhibit this downway, uh, uh, downstream pathway that leads to gene transcription and cancer proliferation. So especially for your non-smokers and female patients, or never smokers and female patients, they are commonly EGFR mutated. So keep that in mind. Even for the old lady that's never smoked, that's 90 years old, that don't want to come and see us, it will make a difference. So in 2004, those were the uh, mutations that we were aware of, and only in about five years, we're now sitting with all of these and even more. So it's a rapidly changing field after that period of about 20 or 25 years of no progression and treatment, we now have all of these drugs available. So this is a patient I treated, was uh, she presented uh, um, with a chronic cough and was investigated and found to have this adenocarcinoma. <clears throat> and she was one of those patients that didn't want to come and see me, which she was content with the life she had and just wanted to go. But she still had a few things that she wanted to do and get some things in order. So this was July 2020, and six months later, after starting her on Tarceva, with almost no side effects, she had a fantastic response. It wasn't uh, until six months later, uh, a full year after treatment, that she eventually did progress, as we know they do, and she then stopped treatment and passed away a couple of months later due to brain metastases. But the point is that for that year, she had really good quality of life, and her main side effect was only a skin rash. Um, so yeah, and they, they're oral, they only need to come and see us maybe once a month or once every six weeks if they tolerate it well, so a really good option. Other TKIs are the um, ALK fusion oncogene uh, uh, targeted therapies. They are present in even less of our lung cancers. Again, also in non-smokers and more common in, in the adenocarcinomas, but also very well tolerated and makes a big difference to our patients' lives. So, so the ALK fusion protein uh, is a result of this mutation and then stimulates this whole cascade and we've now got five uh, ALK inhibitors to choose from. And this is again one of our patients that Asina Asmol treated. She was diagnosed in 2014 at the age of 40. Never smoked, fit and healthy. And uh, back then, she tested positive for ALK, but we couldn't get uh, um, access to the drugs and a medical aid wouldn't, well, it was a funding problem. And so she kept on going for three years on the traditional chemotherapies. And then eventually in 2017, started on seritinib. And uh, by the following year, she had a complete response of all her metastatic deposits on PET-CT. 
And yes, not everyone has these traumatic responses, but still, it's worthwhile. She progressed in 2019, and by that time, there were newer drugs available, and she even had a third uh, TKI before she eventually passed away in 2021, seven years later. And for her, it meant seven years more with her family and her children. And then immunotherapy came along around about uh, 2011, 2012, and again was tested or trials were done on various types of cancers. And lung cancer, the role is more for the patients that do not have driver mutations. Um, so these EGFR and ALKs that we just spoke about. So we test them for PDL1 receptors, and if they fall within a certain category, we combined uh, the immunotherapy with immunotherapy with chemotherapy. So again, it's very well tolerated. I use uh, pembrolizumab or uh, Keytruda more often in melanoma and various other cancers. And honestly, uh, uh, apart from the cost, it's really well tolerated. So the, um, the some tumor cells express these PDL1 ligands, and on your T cell that's supposed to mediate cell death, uh, uh, the receptors are blocked by these ligands. So Ketruda or pembrolizumab is a monoclonal antibody against those. So they block those receptors. Oh. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Almost done. So, so um, the immunotherapies, there are, there are various immunotherapies available now, and they, they work really well, but they are extremely expensive. Ketruda, for example, is about 80,000 Rand a cycle, and it's given every three weeks. So that's about 1.3 million Rand a year. Now, luckily, Discovery and some of the bigger medical aids are paying for that now, and we've got a, a fund called AICF, where they, they pay the co-payments uh, for those patients. So Discovery would usually pay 75%, and then the AICF would cover that 25% uh, co-payment. So it's available, we're using it a lot, and uh, it's really well tolerated. So um, my take-home message for this evening is that we've made a lot of ground in treatment, systemic treatment of lung cancers. The treatments these days are much better tolerated. Um, and we really do make a difference in the adjuvant or preventative setting as well as in the metastatic setting. So please tell your patients to put away their cannabis and come and see us. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> so basically, only if you don't have cancer, you should be in <laughs> I think that might be one of the factors increasing to your risk, ironically. <laughs> Any questions? What we often see is, I think, the cancer we see the patient coming back to us with complications of chemo and all those things <clears throat> with neutropenias. Yeah. Immunotherapy is not a very known treatment modality yeah. for, for, for us real people. <clears throat> I just want to know what do we look out for? In, in a nutshell, sure. Just in a nutshell. Yeah, yep. that, that's quite a tricky one. And when I counsel patients about immunotherapy, it, it takes a while because um, it, you can have a, a basically an autoimmune response type reaction on, on any of your organs, so skin, lung, kidneys, bowel. But what I see most often is colitis. So that could lead to uh, perforations if not um, uh, recognized early. So if patients have diarrhea um, and they're on immunotherapy, let us know immediately. Then we, need, we start systemic steroids to, to blunt that response. And, and in many cases, that's one of the limiting factors uh, uh, that limits us to continue with immunotherapy. Um, but honestly, I've, I've only had to stop one, uh, uh, one of my patients on immunotherapy due to colitis. And for the most part, they tolerate it really well. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've even had patients come back and say, you know, they're paying 80,000 Rand for this and they're not having any side effects. Are you sure, you know, <laughs> someone doesn't put saline into that vial? So it, it's really making a big difference. And, and, and except for lung cancer, <coughs> what other, I mean, does it have a broad spectrum of... Yeah, so, so in renal cancer, also, and um, in bladder cancer now, but the big one is melanoma. 
Um, so, so we know that melanoma is, a, it is an immune dermal disease, and uh, that, that's where it's making the biggest difference. You know, patients that were 10 years get some morphine and be sent home, you know, now we get complete responses to, uh, me and Brett spoke about the patient that, that I'm, we're treating at the moment, that had extensive intramuscular metastases and bone metastases all over on a PET scan, young woman, and, and she's had a complete response and remains in remission still. So it, it's very exciting. Uh, so in melanoma especially, that's, that's where immunotherapy is, is probably most often used. Thank you. Um, are there any screening tests that you can do for families um, other than BRCA? Because we've been here for a long time with families, and we, we, we see the anxiety yeah. uh, amongst the extended family. Yeah. So if there is a very strong family history, um, you know, and there and there are certain cancer types that would fall into certain uh, syndromes, uh, if anyone wants advice on genetic counselling, um, I refer my patients to Sarah Walters at Ampat. So. You can reach out to her, she's very approachable. You just email her and she'll tell you, okay, yes, there's a concern or maybe we need to do this or that. Um, but we generally don't advise bracket testing or other genetic testing just because someone's concerned. Um, and there must be a, a good family history and, and it is an expensive test. Um, so, yeah, if there are families that are concerned and they are strong, it, and there are multiple cancers in that family, then genetic counseling is a good idea. I'm sorry, so I just want, would like to know, in comparison to the traditional chemo, um, the time frame for the um, treatment cycles of this type, how, how, what's it different? So it depends on what setting we're using it. In the adjuvant setting or preventative setting, the post-operative setting, which we're hoping that we'll see more of in future with the screening programs, we give uh, chemotherapy for six, four to six cycles. So that's about six months of treatment. <coughs> Immunotherapies we typically use longer for up to a year in the adjuvant or preventative setting. Again, that's variable depending on the cancer. Um, for the TKIs that we spoke about in the metastatic or unresectable uh, setting, we would continue those treatments until progression and then try something else. Can I make a suggestion? Yes. That the doctors be allowed to go and have a look at your unit in your tin. Yeah. Because I think that's very informative as a primary care physician yeah. to actually go there and see how your onco sisters and the whole setup works and they understand what happens to a patient. Yeah. Um, it's a lot more caring than it actually. Yeah, you're welcome anytime. Send my number around. Uh, whenever you're driving past there, we're right next to the highway there. Just pop in, give me a ring. Even if I'm not there, me or Robbie or Shane will be there and we'll show you a quick tour. Okay. Thank you, Pelham. Um, I think it's one of the most exciting fields at the moment is the evolution of, of, of treatment for lung cancer. Um, and there I said I was on a, on a conference the other night and uh, we were discussing new treatments and uh, I was asked for my opinion being a surgeon there and I said, well, maybe in the future there'll be no more surgery because the treatment's going to be so good. <laughs> But there were a couple of people who said no, the surgeons still, still have something to do. Um, our next speaker is going to be Phil Hartwig, who's uh, with uh, one of the uh, partners in Kaufman uh, <coughs> Partners. And he's going to talk to us about the real meat, actually, is low-dose CT scanning screening for lung cancer. Thank you, Phil. Thanks. Thank you for having us all here this evening. Uh, James reckoned before I started, I had to explain my eye. No, it wasn't a bar fight. It was a boomerang that I was playing with, with my son and I thought I could catch it and I missed it, unfortunately, so. <laughs> I told my wife I'd tell every person a different story, but, but that's the truth. <laughs> okay, I must give some credit to Van Harumso, who's one of my partners. 
he uh, provided quite a lot of the slides. He was actually in Calgary for one of the trials that they were doing on this some years ago, so he had quite a lot of information. So some of the screens have, have more info than what's needed for this talk, but they are quite useful. So basically, as James said, CT is one of the new, newer screening methods that is really coming out for low-dose CT. Um, to go on, as Jaron said earlier, uh, lung cancer is the most common cause of cancer death worldwide. Um, and cancer screening with low-dose CT is an imaging strategy that is beginning to be adopted for high-risk patients in some health systems. It's not widely accepted across the world yet. Uh, Discovery is now going to be doing it and hopefully some of the other medical aids. So that's quite a, a, a very important progress point in South Africa. Um, and there's accumulating evidence that the mortality benefit exists with screening of carefully selected patients. It's not going to be every Tom, Dick and Harry. We'll go through the criteria later. But in selected patients who meet the criteria, it has a huge role uh, to play. So that's just the contents of the talk. Various screening uh, uh, studies started going back to roughly 2004, trying to analyze if it was worth screening patients, which patients, how they were screened, and all the rest of it. The two most important scans, as Jaron alluded to earlier, was the National Lung uh, Screening uh, Trial and also the Nelson Trial, which was in, in uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. And particularly the NLST trial was hugely uh, influential in getting going with low-dose CT. So the NL NLST trial was the first randomized control trial to report a significant reduction in disease-specific lung cancer mortality due to screening. The investigators reported that 320 subjects needed to undergo screening to prevent one death due to lung cancer. That seems like a high number, but for that one patient, it, it means the world, literally. Um, of note also on CT, 96% of the positive results that they came up with in that trial were actually false positives. So a huge amount of the things that we're going to find on a CT are not going to be relevant. We'll go through later um, on what's called lung rads, how to determine what should be done and what's important. Um, so lung cancer is the third most common cancer among men and women and the leading cause of cancer-related deaths. Current estimates suggest that about 7% of people born today will be diagnosed with lung cancer in their lifetime and almost 6% will die of it. 75% of patients with lung cancer present with symptoms due to incurable advanced disease, which is what Jaron mentioned earlier as well. And approximately 85% of lung cancer cases in the US are attributable to smoking, and a high percentage occurs in former smokers because the risk continues after the smoking stops, which is the question you asked earlier. So just because you've stopped smoking, doesn't mean that your, your risk is decreased. So the trials have shown that there's a benefit for up to 15 years after you stop smoking in, in screening because your risk persists then. And I was interested to hear what Jaron said about foodstuffs and all the rest because I agree with him. Preservatives, foodstuffs, over-processed foods and everything, I think they contribute to the cancer burden. Um, Basically, the, the U.S. Um, Preventative Services Task Force Review went through all the studies. The most important was the NLST uh, screening trial, um, which basically took three low-dose CTs with three chest x-rays. So they had to have a control group, and they controlled it with a chest x-ray. It was a randomized control trial with about 53,000 uh, people in it. About half of them, about 26,000, had CTs. The other half had chest X-rays. They were between 55 and 74 years of age, either former or current smokers with over a 30-pack year history. They did three rounds of annual screening, um, and they were considered positive if they had at least one non-calcified nodule of more than four millimeters. If a nodule was stable over three screening sessions, it was considered benign. 
and as I said, they used a chest X-ray as uh, as a control. Low dose CT detected more nodules than the X-rays and greater than twice the diagnosis of stage one A cancer. So that's what the surgeons want. If you can get it early, they can cure it. So you're doubling your, your pickup of, of stage 1As. They stopped the trial after six and a half years when they showed that you could have a decrease in lung cancer mortality by 20%. So 20% relative reduction in lung cancer mortality in, in the CT arm as opposed to the X-ray arm. Um, and the absolute risk reduction in lung cancer deaths was about three to four per 1,000 individuals screened. So it was conclusive evidence that it was worth doing. As I said earlier, for every 320, well, you had to screen about 320 to save one life. To put that in perspective, mammography, as we said, every October we have our breast cancer awareness ribbons and we carry on. Mammography, you have to screen. Uh, a screen between 465 and 601 patients to save a life. So it is low dose CT is definitely of, of benefit. Um, and so their conclusion was it seemed to reduce lung cancer mortality, which I think has been conclusively um, proven since then. Um, I won't go through this now. The CMS, it's not the Council for Medical Schemes in South Africa, it's a big body in America that uh, evaluates what Medicare pays for. They decided to cover low dose, uh, sorry, lung cancer screening with a low dose CT for asymptomatic individuals between 55 and 70 with high risk tobacco uh, uh, history. So that was in 2015, including people up to 15 years after they had stopped smoking. And it was agreed that screening would be discontinued once a person developed a health problem that substantially limits life expectancy or ability or willingness to undergo treatment. I'll get to this later, but one of the things before a patient even gets uh, enrolled in a screening test, they have to be properly counseled because there are a bunch of things that may evolve out of the findings of the low dose CT. If they are not ready for that, it's absolutely pointless even enrolling them in the trial. So this is what they had in 2015 in the States. You had to go through this whole questionnaire. Um, are you 55 to 70, your smoking history, all the rest of it. Then very importantly, are they healthy enough to have lung surgery if it is needed? And are they willing to go through what needs to be done? Because it turned out that quite a lot of them weren't that keen and it was pointless. So you have to have shared decision making with the patient before you even start the process. You can discuss the potential benefits, the potential, um, potential harms, including false positives, following up if an abnormality is found, possible complications of invasive testing, overdiagnosis, which we'll go into later, and also radiation um, exposure from the CT that you're going to have every year. You've got to discuss comorbidities and the ability or willingness to undergo invasive diagnostic procedures and treatment and then counsel them about how they're going to have to adhere to, to, the, to the trial or to the, to the screening. The importance of maintaining cigarette smoking abstinence or smoking cessation as applicable. So basically get them to stop smoking. False positives, there were up to 96% false positive findings in some of the trials. Um, and that leads to a whole array of different things. Further imaging, invasive tests, biopsies. Those things wouldn't have taken place without screening. So that can cause quite a lot of patient anxiety. You can also get false negatives. Um, not every single lung cancer is going to be picked up. So I, I think patients who have come for screening and gone through the things for anything, with a mammogram, for any screening test, and they're told they don't have cancer and they later on found it, it, understandably, they're quite upset. You could find advanced malignancy. Uh, they might not be amenable to treatment, um, and sometimes the patient becomes aware of that earlier than they would else have, um, 
whether that's positive or negative probably depends on the patient. Also definite overdiagnosis. We do this in radiology all the time. We diagnose things that were not known otherwise. We we do a CT for a pomni embolus and we discover something and it leads down to a whole cascade of things that six months down the line turns out to be irrelevant. So lots of things get diagnosed and there will be overdiagnosis with a screening program. And comorbidities may well be found, particularly aneurysms, uh, things like that. Other thing is obviously radiation. Low-dose CT only gives you about 1.5 millisieverts of radiation. That is roughly the same as you get in about six months of background radiation just being alive. Certain parts of the world, particularly high-lying areas, I think Denver and Colorado has been shown to have the highest background radiation, so don't go and live there. But you get basically six months worth of background radiation from a low-dose CT. The different manufacturers all have their special protocols um, that they advise. For a while, the advice was that you come up with your own protocol and tailor it. But I think at the end of the day, the recommendation is now go with what the manufacturer tells you to do. They know their machine and they, and they have tailored it to the best thing. So it's an unenhanced scan. Don't need to give intravenous contrast, which is important with anyone with allergies or, or um, decreased renal function. It's inspiration. You can go through the whole of the lungs. As I said earlier, it's about 1.5 millisieverts, which is about six months background radiation. Because it's low dose, it is of good value in evaluating lung nodules. Not particularly good for other things, but that's not really what you're looking for. So in radiology, this hasn't come out very clearly, I'm afraid. In radiology, we have all our RADs things. So we have lung RADs, we have bi RADs for breasts, we have tie RADs for thyroid nodules, we have pi RADs for, for prostates. And what it really does is it helps, firstly, put things into boxes. We used to call things mildly suspicious, moderately suspicious, whatever. This gives us a way of clearly delineating what it is, what its risk factor is, and most importantly, what we do about it. The latest lung rads came out at the end of last year. Um, and sorry, you can't see this very clearly. You can get a lung rads one, which is normal. You can get a two, which is benign. You can get a three, which is probably benign. You can get a four, four A, four B, and then you've got extenuating factors or special uh, uh, suspicious features or not. So for benign findings, for low-dose CT, the recommendation is you have a follow-up low-dose CT in 12 months' time. For probably benign, you get a follow-up CT in six months' time. For probably suspicious, which is a, a 4A, you get a follow-up CT in three months' time. And for highly suspicious, you get a biopsy or interventional procedure. Um, so this is, you can't see this here, sorry, I thought it would come out clearer. It, it, it breaks it down into the size of the nodule, what it looks like, a whole bunch of criteria, which perhaps aren't that important to you, but are very important to us as radiologists and to the cardiothoracic surgeons as well. You can clearly categorize a nodule into to what it is, and then there's a clear path what you do with it. So for us, this is extremely useful. This only came out long uh, at the end of last year. You may have more knowledge on this. I know you're in one of the groups. The latest findings I could get in South Africa were from 2019. I don't know if they've been updated after lung rads 22. So in South Africa, to, to be screened, you have to be between 55 and 74 years old, a current or a former smoker having quit within the preceding 15 years with at least a 30-pack year history, no history of lung cancer, and in general good health and fit for surgery. The CT protocol, your gantry rotation time has to be less than or equal to 0.5 seconds. I got hold of TechMed. I'm afraid your gantry rotation time is 0.7 seconds at its fastest rotation. It would have to be a discussion. I know Brett has talked in the past about getting a new CT for here. I think the question would have to be, is it better to do one with a slightly slower gantry rotation speed for you guys here? or not do it at all. 
I would think it's probably worth still trying, although it's not quite fitting the criteria. I don't know what Discovery will say if you don't fit those criteria. Your slice the thickness has to be less than two and a half millimeters, uh, preferably one. You have to have 16 or more detector rows. Your CT here has 16. You have to be able to have MIPS and multiplanar reconstructions, which your software is fine, and we have that software. We can do that as well. They have to be able to hold their breath and have a scan time of less than 25 seconds. Particularly with a smoker, they're going to struggle to hold their breath after that. You're going to get movement artifact. You're not going to be able to characterize lung nodules. So it's imperative to characterize nodules properly that you have to have a proper breath hold. And you go all the way from the lung apices to the costophrenic uh, angles. This is a CT in a this was a lung rat one CT in a 77 year old man showed a solid nodule in the right lower lobe. We measure the, the maximum uh, diameters in the two longest, uh, the longest and the shortest planes, and it had a mean diameter of 20 millimeters, which is quite suspicious. But when you change it to a soft tissue setting, it had a Hounsfield density of minus 77, which is fat. So water is zero, Hounsfield density higher than water is soft tissue and it goes up to calcium. Below water is fat. So despite its large size, it was a lung rads one, because you could clearly say that it was a benign lesion, probably a hematoma. So there it is, 75 Hounsfield units on the, on the soft tissue setting. Here's another CT, 59-year-old woman, uh, sorry, in a man, showed a solid nodule, left lower lobe, average diameter was 5 millimeters, which categorizes as a lung rad 2, appropriate management, screening in 12 months time. So we have special or, or definitive guidelines on what we have to do. Here we have 61 year old man with a lingular non solid ground glass nodule sitting over the mean uh, diameter with 14 millimeters, which was characterized as a, a lung rads 2 and follow up in 12 months' time. We have a 66 year old um, with a solid nodule in the right upper lobe, mean diameter was 4 millimeters characterized as a lung rad 2, follow up in uh, 12 months with a low dose CT. Sorry. Go. Another nodule, 66 year old, solid nodule, right upper lobe, mean diameter 4 millimeters, lung rad 2, follow up 12 months CT. At 12 months, nodule had grown to 9 millimeters because of the interval growth, it now gets reclassified as a 4B, is resected, showed an adenocarcinoma. 57 year old woman, solid spiculated nodule sitting in the right middle lobe there. Mean diameter was 17 millimeters, which made it a lung rads 4B right from the start. Also had speculation, which is one of the, uh, the increased suspicion factors, so it became a 4X. Did a CT scan, showed uh, avid um, FDG uptake, squamous cell carcinoma on a CT guided biopsy. So that's what a CT guided biopsy is. The patient goes into the scanner, they have to hold their breath. We put a coaxial needle in, and then through that, another little needle, we can under CT guidance do a little biopsy of that, get some tissue, send it to the pathologists, and confirm the uh, malignancy. Okay, so here's, here's just. Uh, um, at the bottom of the field of view, found uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. So lung rats findings were category one. From a lung point of view, carried on screening uh, 12 month intervals, but had to have a contrasted CT angiogram to fully characterize the abdominal aortic aneurysm. In this case, it was of benefit for the patient to find this because they could be stented and uh, treated before it ruptured. And as we said, uh, screening CT in 12 months time. When should screening stop? I don't know that there are South African recommendations yet, 
but the the American guidelines are if you turn 81 or if you've stopped smoking for more than 15 years or you have a health problem that makes you unwilling or unable to have surgery if you find lung cancer. No studies have evaluated whether public statements regarding low-dose CT uh, benefits affect smoking behavior. In other words, will some patients say, well, that's fine, I'll carry on smoking, I can still have my screening CT, or the rest of it. There haven't been studies. Um, I suspect that a certain subgroup of, pop of the population will take it as a uh, go-ahead to carry on smoking. As we said, low-dose CT uh, dose is about 1.5 millisieverts. Um, in the trials that they did, there was a substantial variation in that, but as uh, manufacturers are more and more aware of this, and there's competition between them, obviously when practices buy a CT, this is one of the things they're asking, um, they are, are working on bringing this down. A normal CT chest has a dose of about 8 millisieverts. Um, the data from the NLST predicted about one cancer death caused by radiation from imaging per two and a half thousand patients screened. So there is a tiny risk, not uh, substantial. Risk benefit is substantially in favor of, of benefit. Um, as we said, it often picks up other abnormalities, uh, lots of false positives, but with lung rads, and lung rads is getting better and better at characterizing things as benign or malignant and giving guidelines. And as it comes, uh, as we get more experience with it, it will, our, our false positive rate will go down. More than 90% of the nodules um, were, um, were benign on the, on the screening trials. So here we get to the workup of nodules. In most of the cases, a detected nodule, this is in the trials now, needed further imaging. Um, management protocols were inconsistently reported. Now we have lung rads 22, which is by far the most uh, specific for what we need to do. Um, so this is getting much better. Complications were mainly, this is in the trials now, the complications were mainly from surgical interventions. Um, complication rates after bronchoscopies and needle biopsies were low. The vast majority of major complications were uh, after surgical procedures, which is what you would expect. You've got a high-risk patient who's smoking, he's going to have COAD, probably coronary artery disease, but the potential benefit still outweighs the risk. Lots of overdiagnosis in the trials, and that will still be uh, in play today. Um, overdiagnosis was, uh, refers to histologically confirmed cancers, which were identified through screening, but would not have in, impacted the pa in the patient's lifetime if they weren't if they were left untreated. Um, it includes patients who are destined to die of another causes. Earlier studies suggested that chest X-ray screening may had an overdiagnosis of about 25%. There's a rough overdiagnosis percentage of about 18% with low-dose CT, which, as I mentioned, will go down as our experience with this improves. Quality of life, most importantly, anxiety. 46% of patients reported psychological distress while awaiting results and also building up waiting for their next CT scan. So they were anxious. Um, there have been no definitive trials on this and I think it's going to be very patient um, specific. But anxiety was a specific thing that patients in the trials and I think in real life patients who are getting a yearly CT scan anxiety will um, impact significantly on, on that. There is no gold standard for negative findings on screening low-dose CT. Sensitivity is typically determined by considering new incidents of lung cancer presenting within a year. Uh, variable um, uh, 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 reports on the studies. Sensitivity for low-dose CT for detecting lung cancer range from 80 to 100% normally more than 90%, implying a false negative rate of between 0 and 
Raising the threshold for nodule sizes to consider positive will increase specificity but will decrease sensitivity. So once again, as we get more experience with this, I think lung rads will continually be upgraded and we will get more sensitive. These figures were before lung rads 22, which is a specific, uh, sorry, a, a, a definite upgrade um, to the previous ones. Most of the studies had incidental findings, um, coronary artery calcification being the most common. Most of those incidental findings were of no significance. Aneurysms and various other things were found as well. Okay, so the take-home message is in the correct population group, it has the potential low-dose CT screening, has the potential to save lots of lives and get lots of patients with earlier stages to surgeons and oncologists to actually make a real difference. More questions? There have been no other studies besides on smoking patients like asbestos exposure or anything like that with, with the low dose, so it's just pure style. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's mainly smoking is, is the big factor. There were trials that started showing when, when risk benefit happens, all the rest of it, and the stats definitively showed that if you didn't have these risk factors, the age, the smoking history, all the rest of it, your risk from the CT was higher than the potential benefit. Um, so basically, they've worked out risk benefit and it's, it's with smoking. Is there any way of combining the calcium score with the screening? No. Two different, totally different, yeah. different scans. And this is a very, very low dose. So you can give a, you can give a rough idea. Yes, we've seen coronary artery calcification, so you might be able to report uh, accurate. I wanted to ask for yeah. private pain patients, how, how much is this? I don't have a figure for yeah. Billing in radiology is all determined by the medical aids. So a low dose CT or any CT is basically, we, we build medical aid rates. So a CT chest, an LMR CT chest for momentum or discovery or, yes, and we, we charge the patient what the medical aid pays. For a private rate, we take the biggest medical aid, which is discovery, and we charge for discovery rate. So there's no set figure, basically, as off the top of my head, I don't know. I'm sure Discovery would be able to give you anything. Probably in the region of 24,000. One more question, Paul. Yeah. Why is the low dose CT more suitable than the high resolution CT or the normal CT, like unenhanced chest? Because the unenhanced chest is giving more radiation to see more detail of all the other things, lymph nodes, the vascular structures, the, the, the virtual bodies, the axillary regions, so you can give a higher dose of radiation. This is a very low dose CT, which is specifically look at the lungs. So you don't see the soft tissues well, but you see the lungs well. So your, your, your radiation dose is way lower, but your, your definition is lower as well. Um, sorry, so just for this specific study, it's only those patients, you just do the low dose, you don't do the normal CT chest? No, because the normal CT chest has, has, has about 7 to 8 millisieverts yeah. of radiation. A low dose CT, your so average dose is like 1.5 millisieverts, so it's way low. So, you, so your detail on the CT is way low. So it's going to be very hard, those incidental findings, like we saw that aneurysm, mm -hmm. the detail on that aneurysm, aneurysm is very poor. Now that partly because yeah, contrast doesn't do but partly because it's such a low dose. So it's really specifically looking at the lungs. And thanks for the green. Well, well, Phil gave most of my talk anyway. <laughs> Sorry. So um, I'll have to sort of uh, try and fatten it up with some stuff. Um, but, you know, the, well, I'm, I'm, James Fulton, I'm part of the JJ and J practice. And you, you were not, you, you were from Coxstad. Well, man, many years ago I was, <laughs> I was here, just before Brett. That gives you an idea how old I am. 
um, and and uh, I know James Chen, our other partners, watching us. So we've got to perform, or we'll get criticised. Um, the Chinese are taking over the world. We know that. I just want to talk a little bit about the ethical considerations of lung cancer screening, and, and Phil's actually touched on most of it, so I can sit down. Um, but I think it's important. It, it's a great idea, lung cancer screening, um, but there are lots of flaws as well, and uh, you know, I'll touch on some of those. Okay, the need for lung cancer screening re reflects the failure of public health policies for primary prevention. Most lung cancers occur in smokers, but the, the worrying <coughs> thing is we're starting to see more lung cancer in non-smokers, um, and often adenocarcinomas, and that's a group that does very badly. So we're kind of not even going to screen those patients. So why? The early detection is currently the most effective way to reduce the total mortality of lung cancer, and stage one diagnosis, five-year survival is more than 80%, um, and the total overall survival for lung cancer is abysmal, 15 to 20%. We really haven't made a big impact on it, and hopefully the, the newer therapies will help. I think the only cancer that's worse than lung cancer is pancreatic. That still remains uh, the holy grail in trying to uh, treat, uh, find it early and treat it. Lung cancer screening by CT is the only method of, of diagnosing early lung cancer. And blood biomarkers are not validated or used, and I'll touch a little bit later on the most recent work that's being done on them. And, you know, this is the, um, the two landmark studies that are really used to drive lung cancer screening. On the left, you have the, uh, the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial from 2011, which uh, Phil touched on, a 20% reduction in the Dutch-Belgian-Nelson trial, which showed a 24% reduction in men and a 33% reduction in women. And, uh, that was published in 2020, both in the New England Journal, for those of you that want to read the original article. So, again, the, the side effects of CT screening, false positives, inert cancer nodules, unnecessary interventions, anxiety, the cancer risk of CT, cost effectiveness, and the burden. It, we, we touched at the end on cost. Cost is, a, is, is the big driver of everything these days. What is the cost benefit? We don't have an organized healthcare system in South Africa. There's no community based um, uh, interventions for this kind of disease. But the downstream effect of the disease is, is astronomical <clears throat> in terms of, of cost to the patient, cost to the healthcare system, and cost to our society. The false positives, in South Africa, it's a big problem. We, we have the burden of tuberculosis, um, and we will have a lot of pulmonary nodules that are not cancer. So we're going to have a lot of patients that will have uh, um, lung rads of, that'll look like a four, and it's not. Um, and if the patient is a smoker and he's had TB, when is it not TB? When is it lung cancer? Um, and we'll be in, end up biopsying a lot of people with false positive. So uh, our criteria are a little uh, more restrictive um, in that we're looking at six millimeters for a solid lesion and 10 millimeters for a, a, a combined lesion with a solid component. Um, and those are available um, in the Journal of Thoracic Surgery, the South African sort of angle on it. And then inert cancer nodules, um, things like, well, I don't think some of the hematomas are obviously inert or benign. Most of the time, we would take them out because they do grow. Um, you get things like early carcinoid, um, which, you know, look benign. Um, and they're hard to biopsy uh, with CT guided biopsy because they're firm nodules and getting a needle into them is difficult. So we're going to pick up maybe a lot more of these um, as well, and what are we going to do about them? And, uh, you know, uh, hematomas you can observe, 
and especially in the older patient, unwilling to undergo a surgical procedure, uh, it is something to consider, should we or shouldn't we take them out? And it gets back to this combined decision-making. And in this combined decision-making, the family practitioner is really important. And, and that's where all of you would come in. Um, you'll look at the patient, decide how frail is the patient, um, you know, what is their long-term uh, life expectancy, um, and what does the patient want, what does the patient's family want, uh, and, and, you know, the financial implications as well. And that gets back to the unnecessary interventions. Thoracic surgical procedures, I think one of the most fantastic developments has been uh, CT guided, the ultrasound guided biopsy. It's taken a lot of um, surgical biopsies uh, burden away from the surgeon um, and led to a, lot, a less invasive, um, with less morbidity um, way of getting a diagnosis. And, uh, you know, we are fortunate to have some skilled interventional radiologists who can get CT guided biopsies on a lot of patients that formerly would have had surgery. So, but still it's an intervention. They can get pneumothoraces and they can bleed. But at least they haven't had a general anesthetic, haven't been stuck in ICU and had chest strains. So, but unnecessary interventions are what we need to be aware of. Anxiety, Phil touched on that as well. Um, you know, you've got to allay the anxiety. Patients are worried, do I, do I not have cancer? They've been smoking for 30 years, they know they can get cancer. So anxiety, you've got to deal with that component as well. And, and that's where I think, you know, the, the, your um, program uh, nurse practitioner will be very important because you need to have constant feedback. They need to have a number like a cord to somebody. Cancer risk, that's also been touched on. CT scans are not benign. Um, and the 1.5 millisieverts uh, Phil has touched on as well. So um, don't go and live in Denver, as he said. Maybe rather have a, 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 a screening CT. Um, and then the cost effectiveness, um, the burden um, on the healthcare system. Discovery obviously wouldn't have decided to pay for this if the actuaries didn't tell them to do it, because I think there's going to be a downstream benefit. Um, so we're going to balance the false ben uh, positives, overdiagnosis, complications, stress and worry over the prevention of death from cancer. And I think in the right patients, that's a no-brainer. So what is the biggest problem of lung cancer screening? You're not screening, and uh, not enough high-risk patients will be included. You're going to not get enough penetration. And interestingly, in the United States, where people are pretty much paranoid about everything relating to their health, the penetration into the insured population is less than 10%. So it's very few patients are currently being screened. And then the other side is going to get too many low-risk patients being screened as well. So how do we balance uh, all of that? So there's a talk now about personalized screening, where you look at the baseline uh, cancer risk based on demographic smoking and biomarkers. And we're going to come to biomarkers because that is another new field that is being developed. And the, the biomarkers uh, are being updated and a tremendous amount of work being done. And then, of course, our new friend, artificial intelligence, which the radiologists are going to be using more and more and more. Um, you still need real intelligence, but artificial intelligence is going to allow a low-dose CT to be interpreted much more objectively and efficiently. Because sometimes the AI is cleverer than we are, but every now and then it's a bit stupid. How long should the screening interval be? At the moment, it's three years. Um, but, you know, why stop at three years? You know, that's the other question that we haven't answered. Because we know that for 15 years after you have stopped smoking, um, the cancer risk persists. And in some patients, even 25 years after they stop smoking, they get a lung cancer. We don't have the answer. For people who've never smoked, you know, that's another interesting group of patients. In the talent study, they screened 12,000 never smoking participants aged 55 to 75 between 2015 and 2019. They diagnosed invasive lung cancer in 255 patients. 
That's quite a lot, 2.1%. 99.5% were adenocarcinomas, and 96.5% were stage 1. So who do we screen? You know, uh, it's uh, just an open question. So I think we've still got, we haven't got the answers, but we need to start somewhere. And then who is eligible according to your country? If you start in Korea, it's 55 to 74 age, 30 pack years, 15 quick years. In Croatia, where they smoke a lot, it's 50 to 70. So they stop screening after 70, 30 pack years, less than 15 quick years. In, in the uh, UK, um, I think they're still using the same criteria. And in the USA, it's 50 to 80 now. They've changed the boundaries. So they're looking at 50 to 80, 20 pack years, not 30 pack years, less than 15 quick years. In, in the UK, they're using personalized screening. So what are we going to do? Um, so we jumped ahead. And then the methods of defining who is eligible. So the pack years and quick years, it's simple to use, but there's a low predictive accuracy. Um, if you use predictive models for lung cancer risk that the UK is using, high predictive accuracy, it'll prioritize older, sicker people for screening, which is actually what you don't want, because they might not be candidates for any intervention. And prediction models for life years gain, that becomes a trade-off between lung cancer risk and life expectancy. No validation currently for that. But it's, as you can see, it, it looks easy, but it gets more confusing. I mean, could biomarkers decide? So this is actually where, where I'm going to sort of end it. But they're looking at how, you know, how cost-effective will biomarkers become if we get a reliable, validated one. They have to be cheap. And you see that you know, if it's $5, then it'll be really good. It's $50 which is quite expensive for us in South African terms, um, it's still okay, but once you get up to $100, the benefit becomes questionable. And I think like everything in South Africa, we've got to be leaner than everybody else. So um, this is an interesting talk given um, quite recently where this lung cancer um, cohort consortium, which is a group uh, in, the, in Europe, where they're getting together to try and find out what are they going to be able to do to get a biomarker. One group has chosen messenger RNA, another group has chosen DNA, and others have chosen proteins. And I think that, they're, they're, as you can see on the left there, there there's 1,200 circulating proteins that they looked at, uh, which is kind of crazy. I didn't know we had that much protein in our bloodstream that was like not important. And they then went through marker selection and panel design. They've now got 21 proteins that they're going to use, and then they're going to follow these patients. And what they've done is that retrospectively, they've taken blood samples from uh, 15 cohorts that they got cancer uh, in the last three years, and they're looking at their bloods, and they're trying to see what proteins uh, predicted the cancer or were associated with the cancer. It was current or former smokers. Um, so it is a very exciting place. And maybe, maybe that'll eclipse even low-dose CT, but it's something we're thinking about. And finally, will AI eclipse the utility of biomarkers? I don't know. The radiologists will have to tell us that. But it does seem that if we combine uh, AI with um, low-dose CT and hopefully with biomarkers. It's going to make all our lives uh, much better in being able to diagnose lung cancer early. It comes with all the caveats and all the side effects anyway, because if you've got, uh, you probably have this problem with, in oncology, when you do the markers and the protein and they're all up and then they don't have that particular cancer, then you go and look for it. Um, so the anxiety factor is relevant as well. Now, and this is just showing validation models of some of the current bio biomarkers that they're using. They do seem to be uh, valid, but no studies have been done 
in, in humans to use them. And I thought I'd leave you with some homework if you're interested, again. It's the democratic and ethical problems of lung cancer screening, exclusion of true high-risk populations. And that touches on, on, on the fact that it's easy if we can just look at smokers um, of a certain age group and a certain number of cigarettes. But is that everybody? Are we going to miss cancers because of that? And the answer probably is, is yes. Um, and what is interesting, Norway doesn't have a screening program. But they, as such, for lung cancer screening, but they do a lot of CT scans. And they've been able to show that we are missing large numbers of lung cancer patients with conventional screening methods. And this is in the Journal of Thoracic Disease 2019. It's the same criteria. It's the South African um, recommendations. Uh, and this is worthwhile reading for all primary care practitioners um, because it gives the, what the current um, advice is for lung cancer screening, how to do it, all the necessary bits of information and when to refer by Quinny Kuchlenwergen, Guy Richards is on there as well. Um, so, yeah, and that's about, that concludes my half talk. Yeah. Did, did you not like, see the same as Norway with the um, COVID pandemic? That you had a lot of undiagnosed I mean, uh, lung cancers picked up with CTs being done for COVID lungs. Yeah. No, so, I, I, so did you pick up a lot of lung cancers during the COVID pandemic because a lot of CT scans were being done to stage for disease? No, I think, I think generally you might have picked up some, but not a lot. I think because most of the patients that we CT scanning were younger patients who, without comorbidities, who went through it. Um, those are the ones that we usually wound up, you know, ventilating and so on. And certainly in, in the, the ECMO population, we didn't see undiagnosed cancer. But I think because they were selected up, they weren't uh, screening the age group. Yeah, we, we didn't see a significant increase. Then again, you've got to do about 320 CTs yeah. in a high-risk population to save one life. So it's still I had a patient who had COVID, and she had a lung tumor yeah. that James Chen operated, yeah. and she's well now. Yeah. But that was just because she had COVID. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say we saw a significant okay. increase. And she was young and not not in that risk population, or youngish, so it was less than. Same she's 55, and I smoke a female. And she was just on what unlucky admin. Hmm. If she ever recurs, she will most likely have an EGFR mutation that will be very well treated. James, can you come up also? If our HIV population, we have been going on ARVs for about 15 years, yeah. can we expect lung tumors? Or we going to age them, find that we have to have an explosion of them mm. with time, if they are water? Uh, I, 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 I don't think we've seen it in the people being on HIV long. We don't seem to be seeing a lot of bone cancers in the HIV. We see a lot more lymphomas because now they live longer, so they get their carbosis sarcomas and their, their hematological malignancies, but they are not, not necessarily lung cancers. And then off slides question. Hi. Could you perhaps comment? Off oh, slides, Chris. <laughs> Could you perhaps comment on a screening CT of a lung in a patient who has HIV and can't get spent to lung. HIV and? Can't get spent to lung. We find a lot of patients. We find a lot of patients. Yeah. They come in and we don't know if they've got TB or haven't got TB. Yeah. We send a chest x ray off. And four reports it is iffy. Mm -hmm. And we end up doing a CT for some reason, and it's a whole plethora of 
nonsense that goes out. Mm. People need to start on notes and TP and reminders and ground glass. So I'm just wondering from a public health point of view, so that not to is there not a lot of benefit to actually doing with sentiments and evaluations? And if you are going to do something, what comes kind of sentiment? I, I, I think the answer is always fantastic. It is. It takes and the guesswork out of what you do. And CTs always show more than X-rays. Um, the, way, the way we do it, we often, if we're there around, we start off the a CT, we'll have a quick look and then give contrast. It's a lot harder at a distance over here because it's harder you know, the, the gap between doing an unenhanced and they're saying give con. So I would say in this setting over here, for practicality, to normally do a pre and a post um, if the renal function is fine and there's no contraindications. Because you can do it, you can get far more definitive information at one go. Yeah, what we, uh, what we often see is patient comes in with a nice scene four count. Yeah. And they've got clinical TV by losing wide of the sweating, yeah. etc. The chest x ray looks looks very really normal. Really normal and yeah. uh, shouldn't be assured. No. No. To tell you the truth. Yeah. We, we, we then need to go and look for that whether you see him what's on that. Yeah. Uh, so so for, for patients like that, you know, they've got clinical TV, they've got a net nose in for car, we're working them up for opportunistic would you still be pre placed or, or just standard? And, and you're yeah. reading, and now you're reading the spleen. Uh, yeah, now you see, you're seeing the liver and the spleen, and you. <laughs> I don't have evidence to back me up, but mm -hmm. contrasted CT always gives you more information than uncontrasted CT. Having said that, you, might, you won't always need one. But in that particular patient, unless they're an inpatient and it's easy to bring them back the next day or later that day to do an enhanced CT if we suggest it, unfortunately, I would say do a pre and post. Pre and post. Yeah. I think the big thing with those kinds of patients is the parent kind of might be uh, clear, but often the mediastinal nodes are enlarged and you can't pick that up on a plain chest x ray. Yeah. Um, and that's the first thing that they get before they get their implant disease. And I think that's one of the mm -hmm. big values of, of yeah. CT. We see nodes, and we don't need to. We look at the chest x ray report, it was normal. Mm -hmm. Your CT scan with a big subcolonial thorough and, and trachea nodes. And that gives you the diagnosis. Now, for us, it's a, it's a, it's a game changer to, to be able to diagnose TB in a CT like that because you now have to make a decision. Or you going to treat TB first, then you share the ARVs and go from there. Uh, or are you going to treat with ARVs from the onset and put them onto INH prophylaxis for six months yeah. and uh, prevent them getting an iris. So the um, it's a, it's a it's powerful information for us, you know, and if yeah. you can get that information you can actually be a little bit more accurate in the way that we deal with our patients. Yeah. It's not that you just say, like in that subset of patients that I deal with, I think, I don't know what the access is here, but suspicious CT chest in the patient is really good on TV. Often you get positive PCRs on bronchoscopy. And I just don't know, I think, and uh, in our setting of that same Andrew, but uh, in the bronchial ultrasound for the with the spinal nerve, with the biopsy, with that thing. So, but that is also something that potentially, I don't know in terms of accessibility or family, um, but you know, versus treating someone for six months, and I know to go somewhere for a long wait is a, is a long way to go, but it's not a six month wait. I just, you know, as you were talking, I just thought to myself, and, you know, and, oh, even. Some of the other, you get some notes to do that too. Yeah. I don't know what you think. Just get a bronchus prep and you'll show them. Yeah, and you'll come. Yeah, and you'll yeah, show them. Yeah, it it's not bronchus. It's not bronchus. Yeah. It's weird. I don't know what you're watching.
Those were the star of words that you bought so, you know, and the TV. You know, how often do you get India all of this? It's strange. You know, you have to it. You know, my question, funny enough, is we, I went to a stage about maybe 15 years ago we were seeing India on XDR quite frequently. But I don't think we're seeing nearly as much. Uh, maybe we just avoid patients work a new guy. And it's not and it's been better treated. We do see NDRs occasionally now. But we if I can still remember we've got a lot of XDRs from Newcastle area and Northern Brazil in town. Um, and NDR. You still see the NDR parents in NDR, but much less NDR than the news. Uh, I can't give you a percentage, but we do see them in our Are you seeing much here? Yeah. I think I think it's together very lovely moment of the moment. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not possibly a little bit more um, but here and to your treatment schedules on them. Mm -hmm. uh, no more questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for having us. And I, I hope it's been of some value to you. Um, we need to start thinking about trying to screen patients for lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And we need to work out a, a protocol and a procurement that it would work and the most important thing is to have you know, the other base gather the data and, and follow see see what we get. Because it's a miserable disease. Uh, we we as surgeons hardly see the disease. And you're probably asking my story. So it'd be nice to cure it. Thank you very much.